Hello, and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I am joined back on the show by Mr. Don Bennett. Don, welcome back on. Hey, Bart. Thanks for having me. It is a pleasure. You were on originally, I believe, on episode, I think it was episode 70, uh, where we talked about what you do and collecting, and that was such a long time ago. Uh, We were kind of thinking of a plan of action for today, and I think we're going to talk about a lot of things, but we might retouch on some things from that first episode just to give our, you know, people on YouTube who maybe didn't see it, uh, just in general, kind of a, a, a discussion about what you do because it's amazing oh, and, uh, and then some cool collectible items. So, uh, Don, for starters, let's jump in here and let's tell people what it is that you do with collecting celebrity drums, if you will, rare, mm-hmm. vintage, all kinds of things. So, so how do you explain this to someone you just met? <laughs> what it is that you do. <laughs> so I, many years ago, started collecting drums uh, that were owned by famous drummers, basically, basically owned by my favorite drummers. That was just something that I was interested in doing. Um, yeah. You know, and then I had a drum store and that uh, that sort of evolved into uh, dealing with that kind of stuff with a uh, uh, buying and selling this stuff. Um, and yeah, through the drum store, uh, I just met a lot of the biggest drummers in the world. You know, we, we, uh, dealt in a lot of rare and vintage drums and there were famous drummers who were interested in, uh, in buying that kind of stuff. And yeah, so I just ended up meeting a lot of, you know, my favorite drummers and uh, kind of got known as the go-to guy for that kind of stuff for a lot of people. And uh, it just turned out that uh, a lot of those artists who were looking for one thing uh, would be willing to trade or sell me uh, some of their stuff that they, you know, that they just weren't using anymore. And that's sort of how that uh, evolved. And, you know, as drummers, we have a pretty tight community. And I think as, you know, when somebody was saying they're looking for some really hard to find item, uh, more often than not, somebody would tell them, man, you should call this Don Bennett guy. And, uh, and you might not even have to pay for it. You can just take some stuff out of your storage locker and swap it. So that was kind of a win-win for a lot of people. And it's just yeah. kind of evolved from there. Yeah. I mean, it's it's one of those things where I don't think anyone can set out and overnight do what you do. You have to build the reputation over a long time. Guys like yes. you, Steve Maxwell, you yeah. have to earn your the respect and the, uh, you know, kind of like, yeah, he's legit. These are real. He, he's fair, all that kind of stuff. It's, it's definitely it's not an overnight thing. Very, very important. You know, one bad situation and that could just completely ruin things. Um, and thankfully it's just been, I don't know, it's been pretty easy for me to get along with people. And, you know, I, it sounds like, you know, a slogan or something or lip service or something, but I really do try. It's my goal in every transaction to try to make sure everyone goes home happy. You know, everyone gets what they need. You know, that's that's been an approach that works pretty well. Um, and it's just, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I guess you can't always do that. but. Yeah, demonstrating that you're legit and that you're not going to take advantage of a situation and you do have the other guy's best interest in mind as much as your own, um, that just goes a long way. Really, it goes a long way in just about anything. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's it sounds silly, but it's the old like, you know, do something as if your grandma was watching or your mom was watching. (laughs) And what would they say? I mean, I've I've. I sold a drum set actually this morning at a, uh, you know, go met at a parking lot, sold a little Japanese MIJ kit and, you know, and just being as transparent and uh, it, you're on a much, much different level, but it all boils down to being clear. Hey, I, I still, 
I still <laughs> meet guys in Safeway parking lots <laughs> and uh, and am looking at drums in somebody's trunk or or they're in my trunk. Uh, you know, it's uh, actually yeah. <laughs> Matt Chamberlain used to call me the drum pusher uh, because <laughs> I would. He lived here in Seattle at the time, and whenever he wanted something. Um, a lot of times it was easier for me to, cause we were neighbors and, uh, uh, for me to bring it to wherever he was, or if he was like in a studio in Seattle somewhere. And so, yeah, I was always meeting Matt, Matt Chamberlain in some back alley or something like that with a, <laughs> yeah. you know, we're in the back of my car showing him some drums. So yeah, yeah. So he started calling yeah, me the exactly. drum pusher. <laughs> No, and I'm the same way. It's you open it up the trunk and you show people. I uh, I have been. It has been forbidden for me to sell things out of our house after an experience where I was selling a camera that I used for work, where I would film seminars, which I still do. And these guys drove an hour, and they brought a. It was a father and a son, and they brought a six pack of beer, and they brought it. There was four of them left, so they already started drinking in the car. They brought them into my house and stayed for an hour. And it oh, was boy. like, and my wife is like, what is happening? And I, after that, I was like, you know what? I think I will do it around the corner at a parking lot behind a restaurant that's adjacent to a police station. And it just feels safe. I'm like, yeah, it got really weird. So, um, but I that's could part tell of the you stories. <laughs> you know, that's actually, yeah. I can, I can thank that situation for opening a drum shop because I mean, years ago, you know, I used to do that kind of stuff all the time. Like this is way before eBay. Uh, and, you know, I was buying and selling drums and I'd have, and have people over the house. And there was just uh, like one too many really weird guys show up at the yeah. house that it was m my wife encouraged that uh, yeah. to like, let's not do this anymore. <laughs> like people here in yeah. so many words. Um, and uh, ended up, you know, kind of giving me the push to actually open up, you know, a brick and mortar store, a real, a real yeah. store, not just doing this out of my basement. No, which legitimizes you. And, and it actually, most people, you can tell their vibe from Facebook Messenger or text, but it can actually be dangerous. So that, that's, you know, that's it certainly could. Yeah, that's great to, that you did that. Um, you know, one question that pops into my mind as you're as you're doing this. Well, let me tell people too. They can find you online. It's Don's Drum Vault. But if you go to Don Two Ns Bennett Double N Double T dot com Don Bennett dot com, they can see everything you have to offer. And I'm, I'm sure we're going to go through your site a little bit here in a, in, a, in a bit and kind of talk about some of the featured items. But the next question would be: How important is building relationships? For you, because it seems like you you get one thing that leads to another. It seems like your whole career is probably one thing leading to another, leading to another, and doors opening that way. My life has been a series of one thing, one little thing leading to another little thing, to another little thing. And pretty soon, they're really, really big things. And yeah, I mean, you hit the nail on the head. It is all about relationships. And, you know, this one little thing wouldn't have led to this one and thus this and blah, blah, blah. If, uh, you know, if I didn't treat this guy, you know, 50 people back in line, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Just uh, if I didn't treat this guy right, then it wouldn't have led to this monumental thing out here. Um, just recently, yeah, I mean, so to answer your question, it is absolutely all about relationships. And I, I don't know, fortunately for me, that's just kind of second nature to me. I mean, I, I, I like doing sure. it. You know, we, uh, we're sitting here talking, hey, we're talking about drums. It's just fun and it's easy. Yeah. And, you know, I'm talking to another drummer. So, of course, whatever they're saying is going to be interesting. Uh, it's just, it's easy. I, and like I said, I think it's just kind of my nature to get to know people. Um, so uh, it's not like, like a, uh, a strategy. It's just 
uh, of like, okay, I, you know, I should probably get to know these people better. Uh, it just, it's what would just happen. And, um, I guess yeah. it's different for different people. And I'm fortunate that, uh, that just comes very naturally to just sort of demonstrate how one thing leads to another. So, I mean, I can kind of, in very specific terms, um, I can't remember even somebody introduced me to Bunny Carlos. This is, this is a long time ago. Um, yep. who, you know, who was not a famous drummer, but just somebody we had uh, done some transaction and that led, uh, you know, we just became friends and we'd talk. He said, Oh, you know, I know Bunny Carlos. He's really into drum collecting. Um, I met Bunny. Bunny, we had a great time, traded some drums. Eventually, when he wanted to uh, sell a whole bunch of his collection, he asked me to do it. That was monumental. That was the biggest step of my career. Okay. That led to some of the other guys in Cheap Trick uh, saying, Oh, you know, he, he, help you sell that much stuff? Could could he help me? And I actually ended up working with all the guys in Cheap Trick and with some really amazing stuff um, and, and really never even having considered ever dealing in guitars or anything other than drums. Uh, one of the techs for Cheap Trick also worked for Aerosmith. Uh, and when the guys at Aerosmith uh, had the conversations like, we have this massive warehouse full of stuff that we need to, to, to get rid of because we've got all this other stuff coming in. This tech said, well, you know, I know there's, there's this guy who helped uh, Bunny Carlos and then he helped uh, some of the other guys in Cheap Trick. He, he bought a bunch of that kind of stuff. You should try him. And it's like, I get a call from Aerosmith. And they're offering me to buy an entire warehouse of their gear. Um, wow. I didn't solicit that. That led to somebody at Aerosmith who knew somebody at Def Leppard who uh, then asked me to do the same thing. Um, and which, you know, all these things were, have been monumental steps in my career. Um, so, yeah. Fortunately, it Crazy. just, it, it, yeah. It, it, it absolutely, that is, that's the key. I mean, really, if we're talking about drums or really just about anything is, uh, relationships uh, and just value yeah. them and take care of them. Uh, like you said, like, like your grandmother was watching or, uh, basically that. And for me, it's just like trying to make this a good transaction for the other person, uh, yeah. And if if you make that sort of your goal, then uh, yeah, then the likelihood of everyone going home happy is uh, is really high. Yeah, and it's not an instant feedback of you do something through a text that's kind of a good move. You don't automatically everyone goes, yeah, Don, you did it. It doesn't work no. like that. It no. builds up over time, and in our drum community, as you said. I mean, there's things where someone does something that's, you know, not the coolest of moves and I'm here in, I mean, I guess I'm in the industry kind of, but I'm in Cincinnati. I'm across the entire country from Los Angeles where this stuff is happening and I hear about it. It's a pretty small community where things travel of like, if you do something that's a little, uh, um, unbro, <laughs> if you will, then it, it travels far, but, but good things also where you go, where, where you just get a reputation, one little, one little piece at a time. Um, so it, it all, uh, it, it's the right, it's the North stars, just be cool to people and, and, uh, be excellent as they, as Bill and Ted say, you know, uh, that is, it's just, it sounds like stuff, you know, your, your mom and dad told you from the time you're little. Um, and it's just like, oh. Now I get it. Uh, yeah, now I get they were it. Right. They, they were right. They were right. Yeah. Yeah. So, Don, I think it'd be cool to hear about, pick anyone. I mean, it could be Def Leppard. It could be Aerosmith, whatever. Like, let's talk a little bit more about that process of you get the call. What does that look like? What do you do with a warehouse full of stuff? Like, you get off the phone. What's your next step all the way through getting it all sold you know how does that work who man um i know that's a huge you can summarize a bit and but yeah 
Well, okay. Um, Aerosmith is a really good one. I had done, no, I, no, I had never worked with the band. I had, I'd met Joey Kramer a couple of times and I'd ended up buying and selling several of his sets, but never from him. They, these were ones that he had either given away or, uh, or somebody had acquired and then I ended up. Sure. Um, so yeah, like I had mentioned, uh, one of the, Aerosmith had a situation where they had so much gear that when they got back from the tour they were on right now, there was no place to put their stuff. So it's like, okay, guys, um, something's got to go. <laughs> and, and they're all massive gearheads, you know, so they're like, you know, every little pedal is like, you know, their, their baby. Um, and so, <laughs> I can't and, get and this, rid of that. <laughs> yeah. And so again, when we're not just talking about drums, we're talking about all, all their gear, uh, guitars, amps, basses. Uh, anyway. Um, so I got this call and it was like, would we have this whole warehouse? And it was like, uh, 300 guitars and amps. Um, and, you know, we'd heard you deal with this stuff and, uh, would you be interested in this? And, you know, th the first thing that came in my head is like, what do I know about guitars? I don't know. I don't know the first thing. Um, <laughs> and they actually sent me this big spreadsheet and it was just like 85% of the stuff in there. I didn't even know what it was. You know, I mean, you know, I I can recognize Gibson Les Paul, right? But just all kinds of guitar gear, I had no idea what sure. it was. And I'm thinking, you know, what am I going to do with this? How am I going to find out what it's worth? And then it was just like, stop. This is Aerosmith, okay? <laughs> this doesn't happen every day. Um, this is like, I mean, besides just being a great opportunity, um, I am fundamentally a rock fan and, you know, I grew up listening to Aerosmith and yeah. really what's in my head is like, you could actually work with Aerosmith. Uh, it's like, hell yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so figure it, was it out like, later, say yes and figure it out. Basically. Yes. Boy, you know what? It's funny you say that because that is, that happens a lot. Forget about all that stuff. This is this is a no brainer. Say yes and figure it out later. And that it, that's kind of the story of my life. To yeah. dive way in the deep end and then figure it out. And chances are I won't. Uh, chances are I won't drown. <laughs> you know, could get a little. Hopefully, it uh, it could get a little weird there for a while. May may go under a couple of times, but uh, you know, I'll probably survive. And yeah. uh, you know, just about anything is stuff you can figure out, or find somebody who can help you and and figure it out. And yeah, I I went from, I mean, literally when I brought three hundred guitars and basses from Aerosmith, that was. The first time in my life I have ever purchased a guitar. I've, ne I've never owned a guitar in my life. And wow. that was really diving into the deep end. So you acquire, you buy it all. Yes. Not you, but you, because I know people could do it the other way where you are then helping them with the like, like um, Gary Astridge and Ringo, where he kind of is a mediator in between kind of helping sell things. You acquired this collection. They're, they're done with it. It's on to you to then recoup the costs and make a profit and make a business out of it. In in that situation, yes, that was uh, the case. Um, but I have been a a broker, a middleman, broker, consigner, yeah. um, uh, many times, and I can certainly do that and have have done that, and I'm, I'm doing it right now generally it's just in the long run the ability uh, to the selling party to be able to be done with this 
and get, uh, you know, get, solve their problem of getting this stuff gone and they get paid. And then I go on and I have my two year long project. Um, uh, then, uh, that's, that's generally what works out the best. Gotcha. And that's yeah. what makes most of the people that's, that's what, in my experience, that's what most people have, uh, it, it's been a situation that works best. And, you know, so they get the money they want and I get the massive headache. <laughs> no, I get the project that yeah. I want. And, um, you know, well, yeah, a lot of times they, they've got lots of other stuff to do and they are not in the business of, uh, you know, selling this stuff you know they've got tours to put on they got records to make um, yeah and it just makes, makes sense. more sense yeah now yeah. other ones uh, other ones i have consigned and i've got them you know i've got one I still have one going with uh with frankie benally uh his or his wife uh the, you know frankie was a drummer in quiet riot he had a yep. massive collection and this has been going on for I don't know, maybe three years now. And uh, just, you know, most of it is actually sold by now, but um, there's still stuff. And every couple of months we go through it and I send uh, his wife a check uh, for whatever is sold. Uh, and yeah. she loves that. It's been working out great. And so, yeah, that's yeah. what we do. Well, that's, I mean, then on that side of things, it's got to be, when, when Aerosmith dumps a bunch of gear because they got to get more gear, that's a happy situation. But you're also dealing with people who are grieving and who are clearing out a collection, which is a whole nother situation, yes. which I'm sure you, you're you a very uh, kind of, like we've talked about it, the relationships, and you're a nice guy. So I'm sure you've had to navigate that and be gentle. And I think this is a fair price and manage expectations and, and all that stuff. You know, I uh, that is very true. I mean... The reason a collection gets sold an awful lot of the time is because somebody passes. Uh, uh, and actually, I got indoctrinated into that very early when Elvin Jones passed. And, you know, it was, <laughs> it was the same thing that, uh, that we were just talking about, about relationships. Uh, one of Elvin's great friends, Greg, Greg Keplinger, he's a, a drum builder here in Seattle, mm -hmm. um, who I've known and dealt with for many years and, and actually, uh, exactly what you're talking about. I, I think I have Greg to, uh, thank for a lot of my, the, the success of the drum shop that I had, because, you know, Greg is really, a, a mover and shaker in the, uh, Seattle drum world and you know I, I we did some transaction very early on and you know I just treated him the way he wanted to be treated and did him did him right and man next thing you know Greg's saying man, you know you need anything there's this guy over in Bellevue with this little hole in the wall drum shop man he'll he'll take care of you and you know it was just like all of a sudden, all these guys were showing up my 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 place, and they say, "Yeah, hey, Greg Keplinger told me you had a pair of fifteen inch hi hats, and they're awesome. I'll take them." Um, anyway, same thing happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was friends with Keiko Jones, Elvin's widow, and uh, she was trying to sell this his collection. He had a massive collection, entire an entire apartment. You know, they lived on the seventh floor. This was down on the fifth floor. They had an entire apartment filled floor to ceiling. I mean, you couldn't even get through it full of Elvin's drums. I mean, it's a two-bedroom awesome. ap apartment. <laughs> um, I mean, it was like, yeah, it was amazing. I, I could show you pictures of, of it. It just stacks and stacks of drums everywhere. Um, anyway, out of the blue, it became pretty clear that this is too big of a job for, for Keiko to handle on her own. And, uh, 
he said, well, you should call this guy Don Bennett in Seattle. He'll, you know, he's legit. He'll take good care of you. And it was like, I got a call from her and uh, actually it was from Greg. And she said that, yeah, she wants, she wants, she wants you to help her with this. And it's like, man, I was, I'm in Seattle. I was on a plane that night. <laughs> it's like, yes. I mean, it's, yeah. it's like you, I mean, like same thing, like we're talking about. How am I going to get, you know, hundreds of drums from her apartment, in New York to Seattle? How am I going to buy this stuff? How am I going to sell it? Blah, blah, blah. I don't know. I'm doing it. I'm on a plane. <laughs> we'll figure yeah. it out. And we did. Yeah. And that, uh, yeah. So uh, we got a little off track about talking about. Yeah, but you passing. can't be there being giddy like a little kid. Look at these drums because she had lost her yes. husband. And yeah. I, uh, you know, she was, she was having a very difficult time at the time. I mean, her entire life was devoted to taking care of Elvin. I mean, uh, boy, you know, we could do an entire episode just on Keiko Jones, a truly amazing person. Uh, but her entire life was focused on all things Elvin taking care of, protecting, promoting, managing, handling. She was even his drum tech, a little 95-pound woman <laughs> lumping his giant drum cases, setting up his drums, tuning his drums. Uh, anyway, she was, I mean, it was everything, and now Elvin's gone, and she had a really hard time with it. Uh, and her, these drums were her connection to Elvin. So it was, you know, it was very deeply personal and uh, there was a lot of connection there um, and it was very difficult for her to do this but she knew she had to do it um so yeah i right there i got i got thrown in the deep end in that respect once more and you just learn and you know fortunately you know i've experienced the same kinds of losses and have it with people around me in my life. And, you know, I mean, I mean, it's not that hard to know that you have to be kind and, yes. uh, and, uh, conscientious of a person's, uh, feelings in a situation like that and understand where they're coming from. You know, I think, I think that's probably the key is just, kind of putting yourself in the other person's shoes and understanding where they're coming from and what they're dealing with. And, you know, that could be with somebody who's just lost somebody or somebody who is, you know, just selling their drums or they're moving or whatever. Yeah. It's seeing, a change. Seeing the situation from their perspective goes a, uh, goes an awful long way. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Which just human nature to try and be kind to people. And, uh, you know, one thing I see on your website, um, and I'm sure most drum shops, uh, would, 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 would have this sort of mentality, but I imagine marketability is a big deal with what you're selling, where if you can sell Hal Blaine's 1980s Pearl white, uh, white Marine maple drum set, looking at your website, that's got, some name power, Ringo Starr's staged use drumsticks, like having that, that sort of, the, again, the marketability of it, of, of a huge name, that's got to be exciting for you and, and be a big factor in what you can sell of those celebrity drums. It is extremely exciting for me. I mean, that's just like, that's just, <laughs> yeah, it's just Hal cool. Blaine's drum set. Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, Ringo Starr's sticks. He used them. He actually played a show. Uh, yeah. So extremely thrilling for me. Um, and as far as the marketability of, you know, my store or my website. Um, yeah. I, because that's so cool to me. I knew that, you know, I'm not the only one who thinks that's super cool. Yeah. I, and uh yeah so that that was like a a when i had an actual brick and mortar store that was like 
Well, it, it, it was cool to me and it made it exciting for me to come to work every day uh, when I could have all this kind of stuff in the store, uh, which is, you know, important. You know, if this is something you're going to dive into head first, you better be excited about it. And yeah. that absolutely made me uh, very excited. And then it turned out, you know, I was right that um, there's other people that were interested in that and thought it was really cool to come into a store where they could see uh, drums and artifacts that had been owned by their uh, favorite drummers. And really, for the longest time, I didn't even sell the stuff. I just kind of collected it. And uh, I, I could justify collecting it to myself. Uh, for because I could put it in the store and people would it would attract people to the store just like you're saying the marketability yes. marketability yes. and yes. it was only after I sold the store that I just realized that you know I I can't keep all this stuff you know I just and it's really not doing any good for it to just sit on you know you know some shelf in a warehouse in a box um, and I can you know I don't really get any thrill out of that. So yeah. I, I kind of discovered that I now get a much bigger thrill out of connecting the dots, having this very diverse or this uh, piece, some super interesting thing over here and in finding some other guy on the other side of the world who also thinks that thing is super cool. And, doing what I got to do to connect those two dots. Uh, yeah. That's really, that's more exciting to me than just possessing, you know, some cool item. I, I certainly yeah. have my uh, small collection of things that are really near and dear to me. Uh, but yeah, I'm just not, uh, I'm not a collector. Yeah. I'm just not trying to amass more cool stuff That's sure I, there's I, nothing I like, wrong with that if people can do that then great but uh oh absolutely it you just, do it so much it's yeah. the phase that i'm in i i like to think of it as catch and release uh, <laughs> yeah. i uh, yeah i don't need to i no longer need to take that fish and mount it on my wall uh, i just like check it out say that's really cool put it back in the river and wait and see what uh, what the next one is. Yep. That's a good, that's a great visual. And it's, it's very true. Cause it's, uh, and then hopefully those people can enjoy it and pass it along yeah. and, and it continues. But, um, and that does seem to be what happens a lot is uh, really uh, people will, will buy this stuff and they'll get a big thrill out of it for a long time. And it's really cool. And then, uh, then they'll decide they want something else and they'll, They'll call me and and we'll sell it and help them find the next thing. So, yeah, repeat business. So, something uh, I want to mention is um, this might be a roundabout way to get to it. But so, in 2019, very early on, I did an episode with Brooks Tegler about. Um, uh, I believe the first one was about Gene Krupa or Slingerland or something. Fast forward, he called me and said, I got a scoop for you. It was the uh it was the Charlie Watts collection. When Gene bought when when Charlie oh, bought the the Gene Krupa collection that was discovered in a shipping container. Fast forward, that connected me to Don McCauley. Fast forward, then I'm at the 2019 okay. Chicago drum show, and the Gene Krupa bass drum was there that was one from the collection. So getting to put my hand on it and feel it. I feel, and I'm sure you do too, that there is like an aura to these instruments, especially one from Gene that was from the 50s that's just a magical kind of instrument. Um, something about Gene in general is yeah. like that. I, I, I'm sure that you have that feeling of this, of this stuff, but I don't take for granted that maybe sometimes people just look at these instruments as it's just a piece of wood with some stuff on it. I don't care who played it. But I find it very, like, truly magical to be able to, like, to have touched that drum and then you kind of close your eyes and you picture it takes you back to when Gene was playing it and seeing those 
little red can lights that would be on the side of the yes. stage. It's just unbelievable. Do you still get that thrill when you touch the instrument or has it gotten a little, the more you've done it, I don't want to say jaded, but you know what I'm getting at. Do you lose that thrill a little or do you still feel no, that? No, no, um, not, not at all. That's like, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, 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 you know, I walk into my office and, uh, in my office, I have not Ringo Starr's actual Black Oyster set, but it is it is exactly like his 1963 Super Classic set. You know, every nut, bowl, and screw, years, just every little thing. It's that's like, awesome. It's like a perfect Ringo set. Every stand, every symbol, <laughs> and the 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 bass drum head, which is a replica head, but he signed it for me. Um, wow. And so I, that sits right across from my desk and every day I'll sit at my desk and I'll just see that and go, damn, that is so cool. <laughs> yeah, it really is. Um, yeah. And yeah, I get, yeah, uh, you still got it. You still get yeah. the, the, the happy feelings, <laughs> but you know, you you are right. It is just a piece of wood. Uh, and you know, that's not even one that he used. Um, it's still just a piece of wood and it's still just a product that a company built to sell and make money and do commerce and do the stuff that they, you know, just to pay their mortgages. It just, that's all it is. Um, yeah. but once again, Bart, you keep nailing it. Um, that, when you put your hand on Gene Krupa's bass drum and it resonated with you, that resonated with you because you have that uh, that love and that interest and that knowledge in you. And so it resonates. Some guy who, who isn't, you know, uh, is into uh, all that, you know, uh, Gene Krupa or whoever, it's just like, it's like, oh, that's very interesting. You know, that's a drum used by a famous drummer back in a long time ago. That's, yeah. that's nice. Yeah. Um, next, Moving that's on. for lunch. Right. Yeah, um, exactly. Uh, but it's, be, you know, I mean, I'm not trying to get all woohoo here, but yeah, those things are important to you and they resonate with you and you. And it's like they, they, uh, that item does have that moki and they interact. Yeah. Um, yeah. So again, I, yeah, I don't no, want to, I don't want to get too uh, philosophical about it, but I've just, I've seen this yeah. demonstrated a zillion times and experienced it a million times myself. And yeah, it's just, it's, it's a, it's a real thing. I don't, it's a real I don't, thing. Yeah. I don't need to understand it any more than that and what exactly is happening, but it's definitely a real thing. That kind of leads me to the question that I know we talked about in the last one, but I'm sure you it comes up to you probably all the time. And 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 how does it work with putting the value on these? I'm sure you take criticism for this. It's such a oh, thing yeah. of like, how do you, how do you, you know, that's too much. Oh, that's fair. If someone buys it, it's worth it kind of thing. But a uh, long way of saying, how do you value these, these drums? You know, uh, that's a really good question. Um, and one I get asked a lot and yes, I do. Uh, I do take an awful lot of criticism uh, for selling things that are selling things for a lot of money, um, which if, you know, of course, you know, somebody says, you know, you know, I could get one of those for 300 bucks. Uh, and you're, you know, which I honestly, I get, yeah, I, I understand that. I just don't pay too much attention to that. Um, yeah. like we kind of said, the thing is going to either resonate for a person or not. And, um, if it doesn't, that's fine. Um, so I guess I'm just concerned in finding the guy who it does, uh, resonate sure. with. Um, so how do you do that? 
I wish I had a formula. I wish I knew. Um, so, but it is something that I'm faced with all the time. Um, so, it, and people ask me all the time, well, what's this worth? What's this worth? What's this worth? You know, I, I could be one of the most, um, I, most qualified people in the world to answer a question like that, just because it's, it's something I've been doing forever and I do it every day. I don't know. What's, you know, what's uh, some drummer's drum worth? I don't know. So uh, the way I always try to uh, picture that is, or, or is what, what do I think that somebody who appreciated this, like I appreciate, you know, Ringo set in my office. I know there's going to be somebody who appreciates that in this, this thing, you know, for, you know, some other drummer, some other artist uh, that would appreciate that much, you know, just because, just because I'm nuts about the Beatles and Stones. Somebody thinks they're like, yeah, whatever, but they think, uh, winger is like the coolest band that ever happened and you know that's they played that at their high school prom and they saw them and sure. you know has that whole story that we all have okay so what would this be worth to somebody who felt the same way that i felt about this thing and then you know then it'd be i'd be thinking well like okay well how many people like that could there be you know he's could that be like one guy somewhere or would it be, are there thousands of people uh, that would, uh, that would be like that? You know, cause it obviously it would be a matter of finding that guy or hopefully those guys or, or girls, believe me, I, I, uh, in yeah. the years I've been doing this, it, it, this business, I went from dealing with virtually no women to a lot of women, uh, and, or, you know, occasionally be a woman who is buying it for her boyfriend or husband. Yeah, um, sure. But uh, anyway, uh, so I guess that's what I try and do. I put myself in the position of the person who's buying it. It's like, yeah, there's got to be somebody who'd be nuts about this, trying to figure out uh, the, uh, for lack of a better word, I call it star power of a person, a particular artist. For sure. What their attraction would be. And um, and go from there. And also, I also go with my gut. And generally, when somebody asks me that question, there's a number that pops into my head. And you just got a gut feeling. Yeah. Of, I mean, it's like it. Yeah. Uh, it's almost instantaneous. Um, it's before I start thinking about it, the uh, a number will pop in my head. And pretty often, very often, um, that'll, you know, after I do a bunch of thought and research and checking around and just putting together all the factors, that's the number that it all boils, boils down to. So that yeah. first number that just popped into my head. Typically right. Yeah. Well, but it's, if it's, uh, you know, winger, which was Rod Morgenstein, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. So, so, but something it's like, that's something more specific where I'm sure in your case, it maybe takes longer to sell something like that, but eventually I'm sure it finds its perfect yes. owner where maybe a Ringo, you know, tea towel might sell faster for, you know, a yes. good price. But so the time would be got a, a definitely a factor. Yeah. 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 I'm sure you've sat on things for quite some time well, until years. it finds the, the correct owner. And we, we all know this, this is like, you know, um, it's e economics kind of one Oh one, where if you charge more for something, it makes that thing, at you trust it more where if, if, if you're charging, like I used to, you know, teach drum lessons and I started out, you know, in high school, 20 bucks an hour. 
once you start charging 50 an hour, it's more of an apparent value of, okay, this is more legitimate. So you charge more, you can trust it more. Um, I think yes. that's a factor too. Yeah, and you know, um, I do also have, it's like just important to me that, and, and along to what you were just saying, is that this stuff is valuable. You know, um, the history that gets attached to particular instrument and what it did, you know, that's valuable. Um, and it's gratifying to me that, that, you know, people say, well, you know, how can you sell this stuff for so much money? You know, that, you know, it's like, look, this, this is something that's valuable. This did something really significant. And, and, you know, it, 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 uh, acknowledges, it validates the, the history of something, you know, if it, if it, sells for a lot of money. I mean, it's like, it's like demonstrates that this is not just some guitar. And it also demonstrates that this is, you know, whatever that artist did is not just some flash in the pan that just didn't make any difference. It, it was yeah. significant in enough people's lives that, uh, that somebody recognized that and ponied up and, and separated themselves from a lot of money that they had to work really hard for, uh, so that they could own that thing. Demonstrates that that uh, whatever that artist did with it, you know, was was significant. So, uh, you yeah. know, I, I I don't sit and ponder all these things, um, you know, each and every time I do this. But I guess you know we're talking about this and. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, we can. Uh, I can pontificate and, and do the deep dive into my uh, my my thoughts about this stuff. Well, yes. Since you asked, we're um, reflecting upon it now. <laughs> yes, um, I think it's cool that I, I think it's neat to hear about um, people like you and um, and I'm tr I try to do it where like the drum industry is when you start out, you go, you need to be a drummer. You need to be a drummer in a famous band. And that's how you are in the drum industry. But there's so many little side doors that you can go where you have created an awesome business for yourself that just kind of happened as you went. Uh, doing a podcast and YouTube channel about it, that gets you in. Doing social media, doing reviews, doing whatever, drum teching. There's a lot of ways to be in the drum community. And I think everyone respects them all equally. I guess the king up top would be you know, being the famous drummer who's on stage rocking out every night. I think we all can, you know, can agree that that's, you know, pretty darn cool. But, but I, I like that there's so many ways for people to support themselves and their families along the way, uh, kind of it within the drum industry. It's really cool. And to get to meet all these people through both, through what we both do is, is just, it's awesome. You know, it's drums. It's great. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, you're right. I don't think anybody starts out going, I want to be a rare instrument seller. <laughs> I don't, you know, if there's, I, well, maybe they, they probably do now, but they probably, you know, yeah. I don't want to be a drum. I, I want to be a drum podcaster when I grow up. That's, <laughs> yeah. it's, um, yeah, bad. they could do that now. That's like a whole other. I get situation. what you're saying, though. When right. when you're a ten year old and you're like, uh, you know, watching videos of you know whoever John Bonham playing or the YYZ solo, you're like, you know, God, I want to talk yeah. about his gear on YouTube. That's when I'm what older. I that you're, you're <laughs> thinking. That's what I want to do. But yes. but then you start on your path, and you you know, I mean, hey, I saw the monkeys when I was in second grade on TV, and it was just like. That's what I want to do. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, you start on your little path and that's where you're going. And along the line, you discover other things and, uh, you know, these other things that are interesting. And I mean, shoot, go to a NAM show. 
um, virtually everybody that works in the musical instrument industry started out playing. I, 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 yeah. with, with very few exceptions, everybody in the musical instrument industry is a player one of one sort or another. And they started out playing and they yep. moved along and then they discovered they were interested in some facet. I mean, so there's thousands of thousands of people there who have lives and careers, uh, and very gratifying and very enjoyable and thrilling and, and enviable jobs. Well, you know what I mean about enviable, like, uh, I get it. Jobs you would love yeah. to have. Exactly. Um, yeah. Um, that all started out wanting to be rock stars. Uh, and that's where, that's where, that's where the, the, the path started. And, uh, you know, one person might say, well, you got lost on your way. You know, you got off, you, you lost your vision. Well, that's, I've never felt that way. I've always felt no. that, uh, you know, hey, keep your eyes open. Just because you're starting out looking for one thing doesn't mean you might not find something else very interesting on the way. I mean, that's here I go pontificating again. <laughs> and that you're goes, here to pontificate. That, that goes in the uh, in the you know the music and drum industry or or just about anything you do in your life. You know, keep your eyes open. Keep your eyes open to possibilities and. Uh, and, you know, I mean, there is a whole thing about following your heart, following what you love. And, uh, yeah, you, if you, if you follow that, that, I mean, it's certainly been my experience and it gotten me off onto tangents. I never thought I would be going on, but I'm yeah. having a total blast, uh, with it and doing it. Yeah. And, yeah. And I think w people have discovered, you discover things along the way of like, you know, oh, I don't want to be gone from home for a 30, for a month straight. Right. Or I don't, like I did session work for a while and I was like, I love this, but it was like, I mean, it's very difficult and to make a career of it and have a family, it's kind of, things are a lot easier if you're single and don't have kids. Right. So kids get in the mix, you got to start doing something different, but you can. Um, and even then in, in the different kind of avenue, I used to do dialogue recording for like TV shows and movies. And one time a movie was there in the studio I was working at filming a uh, girl from Compton in response to straight out of Compton. It was like a lifetime movie and they were there filming and it was in the studio. It was supposed to look like, um, what do you call it? Death row records in the nineties. And they had everything all painted up. And I was like, this is awesome. But on our 17. Of me sitting there kind of being the location management for the studio. I was like, man, this sucks. I want to go like, no, like it's not really fun. And everyone's sitting there and, and I have friends who do it. And it's great if you want to be in the movies and do all that. But it, that, that was an example of like similar to touring and being gone all the time. I was yeah. like, you know what? I don't want to do that. I'll, that doesn't sound fun to go do, do that route, but uh, that's okay. It's okay to not want to do that. You know? Uh, yes. Well, you know, you just, you, Again, it's like you follow what what your heart, um, and maybe you find, yeah, I love this, but that part I just can't stand. I just can't stand. Well, you know, <laughs> yeah. then maybe keep your eyes open and and yeah, and uh, see what maybe you like this part. All right, Don. Well, this is like flown by. Let me let me ask you one more question. I'm going to ask you the dumb kind of question that I'm sure you've heard before, but like. Give me the like most, uh, it doesn't have to be monetarily, you know, focused, but if you want to, that's great. Like the, the Holy grail item that is what you go to is that was the biggest, like one item drum set, you know, top hat and cane, whatever the like most incredible thing that you sold. Maybe that was a big payday if you want to go that route or just kind of status symbol, but yeah, just the the Mac Daddy of them all. This was the one that I'm most proud of putting in a new home. Um, does anything come to mind with that? I mean, literally, there are hundreds. That's a good problem to have. It is that. I mean, I mean, there have been 
items that have sold for tremendous amount of money. There was uh, one of one of Ringo's All Star band sets. You know, it sold for one hundred and twenty five thousand dollars. You know, I was going to say we're talking some six figure stuff here. You that's, know, that's that's a lot of money, and a super cool drum set, and you know, man, I could go on and on. S- developed, it came from a a extraordinary relationship that I have with Ringo's Tech, Jeff Chonis, just a super guy friend mentor um so that's where it, uh, this the item came from and mm-hmm. then it went to another guy uh, he probably wouldn't care if i said his name but he might so yeah I won't. um that's fine but uh who's a great friend and a great guy and has opened up you know you talk about how one thing leads to another that that one transaction just created a whole group of relationships um, that have have just led to all kinds of great things. Um, this is why it's it's hard for me to to uh, to think about yeah. one particular. No, item. I get but, it. So that one item. Besides just being a, it was an absolutely beautiful, uh, it was made by uh, CNC Drums, I think, mm-hmm. which I think was Bill Caldwell. Uh, yep. I think, I, I hope I'm getting that right. Who? Yeah, it is. Who, or Cardwell. Cardwell, yes. Who yep. made this drum set that was covered in abalone shell. So it sort of looked like white marine pearl, but it's all little squares like about this big of abalone shell set on an entire drum set you know so we're talking about thousands of pieces of this wow. you know to create this uh pattern and it, and you know they had these stars on them these purple stars i mean just a incredibly uh well done amazing piece of art jeff jonas designed ringo liked it and bill cardwell did um I mean, it was just a That's spectacular awesome. drum set. Ringo yeah. signed everything. Um, yeah, so I mean, that was that That's was a, good a big one. one. And like I yeah. said, it was the gift that kept on giving. And then, then that's brought all these people together. That uh, has just ended up ended up doing a whole bunch of really significant stuff that came out of that. Actually, I'll, I'll yeah. tell you. So. This guy who bought that set, uh, and then Greg Bizanet, and you mentioned Gary Astridge earlier. He's you know Gary is like the guy who knows everything about Ringo. You name it, yeah. he knows. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, when Ringo needs to know something about himself, that's who he asks. Ask Gary. Uh, yeah. Um, and then Jeff Chonis, uh, Ringo's tech. There we have this. Uh, friendship and you know you talk about a geek sessions where um you know we're all all obviously very into the beatles and ringo and yep yeah i actually just i just had lunch with uh, all of them uh, at ringo's birthday at ringo's birthday oh, wow. uh, in july cool. earlier or just last month um yep. and yeah anyway and so yeah that's a cool circle to be uh, in Hey, let me, you know when when the Let It Be movie was on. Okay, yeah. so there was a text thread going back and forth with us as we were watching it and geeking out. I mean, talk about mega geeking with with the the greatest geeks in the world. <laughs> Yeah, the the ultra geeks, right? Yeah, you know, and and I'm sure we we're driving our wives crazy as we're like freeze framing so that we could, you know, look at a wing nut on the bottom of the hi hat stand. Oh um, my god! But what that brought to the, I watched the whole get back thing twice, and then let it be was obviously cool. The more like tight, 
film, but it was like Wait, did I say get back or let it be? You said let it be, but I know exactly what you I mean. Where let back. it be mm-hmm. let it be just came out where they re-released it and it was right. a bit in the shadow of get back where it was like, mm-hmm. okay, get yes. back was unbelievable. But um I know exactly what you mean. And it's uh and and uh unbelievable what we get to see yes and so so to get to geek out with like the world's greatest ringo geeks uh it was pretty ridiculous and yeah i think all of our wives were about done with us by the time because you know they'd be trying to watch it too and and we'd be freeze framing on stuff and and yeah and it's like you know who cares about what color the ink is on his bottom hi-hat symbol i'm like but no, no, that it's red. So that means it's Peisty and everyone always thought it was Zildjian. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh my God. That's so cool. Well, you're, you're just even the ability you got to, I've learned the last thing I'll say is you got to, you put in all this work doing this and it opens some doors for you to be in those groups and get the respect of those people because you put in this amount of work and you get those, it's little rewards along the way of like, well, now you get to hang with these people and meet these people and talk to this person. And, and they, they just appreciate and respect you because of everything you've done. And it's, yeah, it's very cool. It's rewarding beyond monetary value. It's cool to just kind of be, um, in those circles. Oh, and that's awesome. Oh, you know what? Uh, Hey, it has worked out monetarily just great. Um, but it's just that small potatoes to uh, these relationships. I mean, those ones I just mentioned and I mean, literally, yeah, it's gotta be in the thousands. It's gotta be in the thousands of just amazing relationships that I've developed with thousands of people um, over 40 some years of doing this. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's really priceless. That is priceless. That's a perfect way to wrap things up. Um, and I think obviously if people are interested in uh, working with you on either the selling side of things, if they are working on, you know, have a big collection they want to clear out um, or on the buying side of things, again, Don Bennett, D O N N B E N N E T T dot com. Um, because Don, do you take like if someone has like a you know a pretty nice rare drum set that maybe wasn't played by someone of note? Do you still oh, do you do work with normal drums? Ab- okay, absolutely. It uh, the the artist's own stuff is a specialty, uh, uh, but no, a- absolutely. Okay, uh, and yeah, and and collections have sort of become my my favorite thing. Um, and there's a lot of ins and outs with collections. Uh, and, you know, I've just done enough of them to sort of simplify things. But yeah, it's it's really uh, all the things we've, we've mentioned about it, you know, and like the, the attachments people have to them and their concern about where they're going to go. And all that kind of stuff. I've just done it enough that uh, it's it's just really fun. And uh, yeah, that's 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 what gets me most excited is when uh, I get a call about uh, a collection and handling all the uh, all the little details, and just making sure yeah. making sure it moves from point A to point B, and all the little things along the line to to make sure everything gets done right. Yeah, which you're experienced, you've done it enough, and uh, I'm sure people can trust it gets done right. So um, again, I'll put a link in the description for Don's website, oh, and you. Uh, you can check it out and. Don, it is great to have you back on the show. We'll have to do it again as as new collections come in and things pop up on your website. Um, but man, appreciate you being here. Thank you, Don. Oh, absolutely. Thank you for thinking of me. Always great talking. And uh, yeah, I hope we're doing it again very soon. Okay. Thank you, Don. All right. Thanks, Bart. <laughs>